Well, this is so exciting. It's Rosh Chodesh ER. We want to welcome you. And we have Chaya here, which is so exciting. She's my teacher um, and has inspired us. So we have the good news is, first of all, that I've been taking Chaya's classes for about, I think, three years, maybe more, I don't know. And it has changed my life. It's literally life-changing and it's free. I say, Chaya, I want to pay you. She's like, she won't take any money. So this is free tools, and they are so good. I've like literally been almost in arguments with people, had whatever, stuff with marriage, stuff with kids, stuff with, I don't know, being embarrassed in a restaurant, and all this from these tools that Hyatt teaches has like saved me from going to this level to this level. Thank you. And then as part of it, kind of at the same time of working on this, um, I started writing, I like to write, and I started writing for Binion Magazine stories, and they all seem to be about Abbas Israel topics, so I thought, okay, I'll put them all together in a book, and then I just couldn't get it out, and I said, this book isn't good. I hired an editor, and she became a co-author, and then she became number one here, because she's number one in this book, and the book is really, you want to say what it is? It's kind of like what Chaya teaches, but, but it's for teens, and for teens. it's for those, for educators, or for parents, or grandparents, for the Shabbos table discussion. It is stories with little activities and bits of information, and this is um, from our Messorah, and after each chapter, and each chapter addresses a certain aspect of our Messorah, but through stories. And these stories are a little bit different than the usual uh, stories that you get from, here's a book of stories for teens, because the attempt to get to keep teens on a gut level, to really get them where they feel, because when they, what happens, all of a sudden, we, we try and teach our kids, and they, we teach them to share, we teach them to be nice to each other, and all of a sudden they go to middle school, and all of a sudden, it looks like the monster comes out of them. All of a sudden, they're shunning each other, and they're bullying each other, and, they, and or they're doing things that are just mean, nasty, or just not making good decisions. And these stories try to address those thought processes that they have when they're doing it, and it kind of guide them back onto the path of Torah through the story, through feeling what the other person would feel when they get affected. So this event isn't about this book, but since it was all about Ahabas Israel, we decided to also bring the books here. So without further ado, Chaya Kruk, um, please teach us these tools. I'm open to learning more and more. And you have a sheet that says all the classes that are taught weekly, yes. so you can come for free and join our classes. When my daughter saw that I was giving this uh, seminar from two to four, she said, you're going to make people sit there for two hours? Nobody can sit for more than 45 minutes. So we will take a few minute break in the middle. So we can get up, we'll do some squats or some uh, something to get us moving again. I don't want to torture anybody. Okay, I'll, I'll let you know how I began. When we started our marriage, we were in Eretz Israel, and I would go to the classes of Rebbe Tzimilhuda Samet. And uh, that's where I learned all of these tools. So all of this is thanks to her. I do not have a copyright on it by, by any means. And um, when I came to America, I just felt like that was the one thing I missed most, was her classes that just really you know, helped me and others grow so much. And I decided the only way to get back into it is if I would teach it myself. But I never saw myself as a teacher, and at first, like, I was so, so nervous to do it. But I gave one class, and people came back the next day, next week, so, wow, I was on seventh heaven. So, now I guess, now I'm a teacher, even though I never thought I would be. So, we are holding now, as you know, after Pesach, before Shavuos, and uh, this time of Sviras HaOmer is a time where... We want to grow, we want to be Zohet to Kabbalah Satora. We have to work on ourselves so that we are so that we merit to receiving the Torah. So that means working on our Amidos and also working on doing mitzvos a little bit better, those that uh, we may have been amiss in. So these tools for Vatranas that we're going to be learning. It, the, the flyers said, tools for positive thinking. We call it tools for batranus, 
And it's really the same thing. First of all, what is matronus? You might have heard the term to be mavater. To be mavater sometimes is used to mean um, to, to give in. You want something, the other person wants something, be mavater. Okay, you can have it. But it means so much more than that. Vatranus is not only giving in, but it's letting go. It's letting go of any type of hurts uh, or grudges we may have. We are, will at the same time learn how not to be angry in the first place. And when we work on Vatranus, what we are achieving is shalom. And uh, we know that shalom is a priority to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I can give you a whole sheer on the importance of shalom. But this, this is meant as really a workshop, more hands-on, not to just know the importance, but to know how do we do it. So first let's say, what is, why, why should I be Mavata? Why do I need to be Mavater? Why do I need to give in? So we just said, because that is what leads to Shalom, and Shalom is a priority. <coughs> so it says, Chazan say, Lo bara HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I don't know if I'm quoting it exactly. Lo bara HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Kli machzik bracha ela HaShalom. That the only vessel that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created that will hold bracha is shalom. In other words, Hashem is constantly raining down brachos. But how do we catch it? If we don't have a vessel to catch it in, it's just going to be lost straight to the ground. We're not going to be able to, to get any enjoyment from those brachos. So if we want to be able to catch it, so to speak, we have to have a vessel, and the only vessel that will work is shalom. If there's shalom, we'll be able to collect Hashem's brachos. So that alone is, is a good reason to want to learn how to be mavater. But you know what? It, it's really hard, because what are we talking about? We're talking about when somebody hurts us. Let's say they snubbed us, they insulted us, they didn't invite us, they didn't come through, they, they didn't give us what they owe us. You know, the list could go on and on why people get upset with other people. So why is it so difficult to let go? Because our feeling is, why should I? You know, they, you know they, I should give them a gift for, for, of forgiveness when they did that. So when we learn what's in it for me, that's what I have to know. Why, why should I give them that gift? We find that when we are mevater, when we are forgiving, when we are letting go of our grudges, we are giving ourselves the greatest, greatest gift. And we'll see also how giving a tremendous gift, gift to Kuala Yisrael, because that is really what is going to help the Beis HaMikdash to be rebuilt. So let's look at some of the mitzvos that we might not have thought about so much that, this is, that we're really focusing on right now. So there's a mitzvah in the Torah of Lo Sitor. It usually go, it goes together in the Pasuk, lo sikom, the lo sitor. Lo sikom is do not take revenge. Okay, I could understand that. I'm not allowed to take revenge. The lo sitor, do not hold a grudge. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me how I should feel when somebody hurts me, they've embarrassed me in front of everybody, or they, they've insulted me. And you're telling me I can't hold a grudge? Like, how is that even possible? It's not possible, right? I feel how I feel. I'm hurt, so I feel hurt. I can't just say, oh, this is a mitzvah in the Torah. Okay, therefore, I won't, I, I won't feel bad. I feel bad when somebody hurts me. So 
Let me ask a question. Let's say, I'll give an example. Let's say, I'm sure we might have someone here who lives on cross country or western run. Let's say you live on cross country and you have a very close friend on western run. And you both live right in the middle of the block. And you'd love for your kids to be able to play together more easily without you having to walk them all the way around to get to them. So you decide, I know, we'll build a bridge over Western Run, from cross country to Western Run. Okay, let me ask you, can we do that? Is that possible? It's possible. We see bridges being made all the time, much longer ones, much higher ones. Can we... Assuming we have the permit, can we can we all march out of here and go build that bridge? Well, that would kind of disturb traffic. Yeah. Well, let's not get too uh, technical there. What? It is something that could be done, but as far as I know, we don't have any engineers here. Not only that. But we don't have the know-how, so we're not engineers, and we don't have the tools to do it. You give us the tools, you give us the know-how, and yes, we will be able to do that. So it is with the tunnels. The Torah tells us, lo si tor, you can't hold a grudge. Lo si sna esachicha bovavecha. You can't hate your brother in your heart. That you should love your neighbor as yourself. Now, these are very difficult, and we could say without the tools of Chazal, it might be even impossible, because just knowing it's a mitzvah, I can't just snap my fingers and no longer be upset. So Baruch Hashem, Chazal have given us the tools. And that is what I hope to give you to you today. And don't think that you're going to walk out of here and suddenly you'll be a changed person. <laughs> we have to really practice this. This is an avoda. This is a work of a lifetime. And you'll see you'll get better and better. But I, I know that in different groups that I've taught this to, like at the very beginning, people will say, you got to be kidding. I don't think this is possible. But after learning more and more, they see it really is possible and it really is liberating. So I will get my toolbox. Maybe this is a little corny. <laughs> but um, here I have the tools. I hope I have enough for everybody. If people want to pass these around, I don't know if one person wants to. Okay. When I was teaching in high school, several years back, so I gave my students an assignment that all the tools that we learned, they have to do something creative with it. So this was one student's project that she did. She made a bookmark with all the tools. And I have used this ever since. It was created by Tsipora Mintz, who is married now. I don't know her married name. But this is what we are going to go through. Whether we're going to do it in this exact order, I'm not sure. But uh, that really doesn't matter. Okay. So now, to start with, I want to think. Someone, we're upset with someone. Whatever the reason is, whatever they may have done to upset us. So, okay, we go back to the mitzvah. Lo si tor, you can't hold a grudge. Okay, the initial feeling of being upset is allowed. We are only human, and we have emotions, we have feelings. But once that, those first few moments pass, then we have to think to ourselves, okay, what do I do with this now? Okay, that's where this comes in handy. I can look at this and see, okay, how, what do I need to think? So we started out here writing the first tool down as done with Hapsopus, to judge favorably. Now this is also a mitzvah in the Torah, but tzedek tishpoda misecha. 
that we have to judge other people favorably. And I think it's the Rambam that says that this is one mitzvah that it's so difficult to do teshuva for because a person doesn't even realize that he is not judging favorably. I see something, I'm hurt, and I think in my mind something negative, and I am over an Easter. I am transgressing a prohibition. What? That person, they're the ones that did something wrong, and you're saying that I am transgressing? We have a mitzvah in the Torah that we have to judge favorably. And that's our starting point when we're hurt. To try to somehow judge favorably, and that could be a whole series of lectures by itself. And uh, a very excellent resource is Rebbitz and Samick's book, The Other Side of the Story, where she goes into it. I, I highly recommend it. So we're not going to spend so much time on that. But just know that that is the starting point. I have to think to myself, as it says on, on the list that you have, do I have the whole picture? Maybe there's more that meets the eye. What's so good about this book is she has story after story where you see the other side of the story, that things weren't exactly how people see. Now, double cuffs isn't always going to clear the person for instance, I'm very hurt by what somebody said, and then I think about it and I think, oh, they didn't say that, I didn't hear them right. Or that's not really what they meant. It could be something that clears the person altogether, or yes, the person did do something wrong, but let me try to understand them better. Where are they coming from? A person is a product of their life experiences. So, you know, really, I can't judge them. I can't judge them negatively anyway, because only Hashem knows what may have worked them up to this point, made them behave the way they are behaving. I'll give you this one example that Revson Samet told us. She said there was a woman in her building who, she was an older woman, and she just was not so nice to the kids. And she'd always yell at them, and when she'd see them doing something, even yell out the window at them. And she just, you know, in the kids' eyes, she was a mean lady. So it happened one day that she was visiting with her, and the woman just kind of opened up to her, and she said, you know what was the happiest moment of my life? It was after I gave birth to my first child. And you might think, oh, you know, I could understand why that would be a, a very exciting, wonderful moment. But it's not what you think. She said, that was the first time I could ever remember that my mother kissed me. And then she went on to explain how her father had died when she was very young and left her mother with a lot of children, a lot of young children. And the mother felt the only way she was going to be able to, she, she felt she had to stay strong if she was going to hold it together. But strong in her mind became stoic, where she couldn't show any emotion. So now you imagine this lady growing up, you know, with, with a mother who was not able to show that motherly love. And you understand where this lady is coming from. Does that mean now she's not a mean lady? Does that mean she doesn't yell at the kids? She's the same, but you're looking at her differently. And rather than thinking, oh, what a mean lady, you really feel more rachmanis for this person because you understand where they're coming from. So she said this was a real gift to be able to have heard her story. Most of the time, we have no idea what another person's story is. So it's just knowing that we don't know. As Reverend Sam would always say, sometimes it's chapter three. Imagine you open a book and you start from chapter three. 
Like, do you know right away what's going on? No, you have no idea. You haven't read the first chapters. So here I'm seeing something in this person, a certain behavior. I don't know the first few chapters of this person's life to really be able to understand him well enough. I'll give you another quick example of Don Lacoste. One of my first experiences when I was living in Eretz Israel and we just had moved to our new neighborhood of Ramo Polin. And um, there was someone there, Chai Rachel Black, who was giving a shear in Shmir Salashon. She had been a student by Rebetz and Samet. And so I came and joined for that first time. Uh, for me, it was the first time, but for other ladies, it wasn't. As I'm walking back to my building with the other women, we find strewn all over the sidewalk was a big bag of, of garbage. So I commented, well, that's a nice place for someone to park their garbage. And right away, the other ladies I was with said, you know what? It could be that a child was sent out to throw out the garbage in the dumpster and they saw a cat and they just dropped it and ran. Or maybe someone else said, someone was bringing out the, gar the garbage and the bag broke and they just now went in to get another bag. I was so embarrassed. Like for me, like, you know, well, what a nice place to drop your garbage. Does that make any sense? Are people like that? Do they just go out of their building and deposit their garbage on the sidewalk? I mean, usually not. So really, Don the Kassuchus is not being naive. It's really understanding. People just usually aren't that way. And when we find a zuchus, that is most likely what it is. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Like I said, we could have a whole series of shiur. Now the thing with Don Lakaf zuchus, trying to judge favorably, that is focusing on the person and what was done. I'm upset, okay, let me think about what they did and let me think about them. How can I judge them more favorably? It doesn't always work. Sometimes, even when we find a zuchus, we're still upset, we're still hurt. Like, let's say somebody yelled at me. So I could have the zuchus, maybe they just really don't feel well, but I'm still hurt. So then I shift my focus from this person, and now I'm going to take a different route. And that is number two on the list, to strengthen myself in Amuna. The first thing was looking at the person and trying to find a zuchus. The second part is reaching up and bringing Hashem into the picture. Okay, strengthening ourselves in Amuna. So you see from these tools, that is going, you, you can't have it without strengthening yourself in Amuna. And the truth is, probably all the rest of the tools are going to come out from that, as we'll soon see. Okay, so we said, bring Hashem into the picture. You see after that, it says NVD. So that is taken from, and I'm just going according to how my student presented it. So we learned, I brought in from uh, Tzipora Heller and Sarya Chavad Brigler wrote a book together, Battle Plans. Maybe you've seen that. A mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful book about how to battle our Gate Sahara. So they have in there about, it's, it's different words for bringing Hashem into the picture. For them it was turn on the light. They give an example of someone who um, I think she, this person had to go, uh, had an appointment to go to where they wanted to go to a shear. So they leave their house with plenty of time. They go outside and they see their car parked in the driveway. And then they see another car parking, parked, blocking the driveway, which was quite annoying because they wanted to get out to the shear and they couldn't. So they're looking around, seeing whose car this could be. They go knocking on different people's doors to see if they have 
a, a visitor whose car just parked blocked in the driveway. And after 10 minutes goes by, and they're already late, and they're just getting more and more worked up. Finally, they see somebody just gently walking with their keys in their hand towards their car. And what, what do you think a person's reaction would be after being worked up all this time, seeing the minutes go by and they're getting more and more late? They might feel like just yelling at the person, like, how could you have done such a thing? You know, what, what, what's the matter with you? So if a person does that, there's something that they are not seeing. What are they seeing? They're seeing their car in the driveway. They're seeing the car blocking the driveway. And they see the responsible person. What aren't they seeing? Hashem. They're not seeing Hashem in the picture. So <coughs> the rule is, there's no other power but Hashem. Hashem is the one. Anything that happens to me, that's from Hashem, and people are shlichim. They are messengers from him. Now, I have this wonderful safer called It Says Hashem Ishbi Guraso, which is all on Vatranus, just different stories and lessons. So, I have a lot of things in here that, that my tools really came. <laughs> came from, not my tools, I shouldn't say my tools, the, the tools Chazal have given us really came from. Okay. So let me share this with you. It says, Rabbi Eliezer Papo said, when we first think about it, a person You know, if, when we're told about the mitzvahs, lo si kom, lo si tor, do not hold a grudge, do not take revenge, and do not hold a grudge. <coughs> so they'll think to themselves, all right, lo si kom, I, all right, so I won't hold, uh, I won't take revenge. I can understand that. But lo si tor, don't hold a grudge in my heart. Don't be happy with the downfall of my enemy. The person who's trying to do bad for me, now that's something that's impossible. So the person will think it. That is a mitzvah for the malachim. Malachim don't have emotions, they don't get jealous, they don't get angry. So that mitzvah is for malachim. But that mitzvah can't be for us humans who have these emotions. Achdana yedidi, but no, my friend. If Hashem has given us this mitzvah, he didn't give it to the Malachim, he gave it to us, of lo sitor, do not hold the grudge, that means it is possible for us to do. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wouldn't send us a mitzvah that is impossible for us. He says, this is what a person has to put to his heart. And believe the emuna shalema with a complete belief that all the good and all the bad that comes to us, whether it's a person, whether the tsara, whether whether the hurt comes directly from Hashem as in an illness, or it comes through another person as in some sort of hurt or slight. No one can do bad to us, or nobody can even cause us a benefit, do good to us. Not the slightest bit. Not to his honor, not to financially, um, without it being a gezeras element without it being decreed from above. That is really the secret to how to relate to anything anybody else does. This is from Hashem. Yes, the person did do it. Yes, they did have Bechira. That's between them and Hashem. And they will have to bring an accounting for that. But as far as I'm concerned, I have to focus on the fact that 
It couldn't have happened unless Hashem wanted it to happen. So why he wanted it to happen? So that will get further in, in our um, tools. Just continue this. Thank you so much. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam shakol miyeti baruch. Just interrupt what I was saying a minute to say about the bracha shahakol niya bidvaro. That everything comes out by the word of Hashem is exactly what we are learning. And it says that when we make that bracha and have that kavana and thinking about shahakol niya bidvaro, that everything comes about by the word of Hashem, that that could bring about Yeshuos. So perfect timing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Hashem has many made messengers, and it's true, Magagalin Zuchusal Yedei Zakai Bechoval Yedei Chaya. That means that a person who's a messenger to cause someone harm, that's because he, for some reason he was Chaya. He he did something that he was going to be a messenger to cause somebody harm. And Megal believes so you saw your day Zakai. When somebody does something good for me, it happens through someone who has zuchuyos, who has merits. So therefore, if we ever find ourselves inadvertently causing somebody a hurt, we have to look within ourselves and think to ourselves, now, why did I have to be the one to get it should come through me and do some introspection and hopefully some teshuva? Okay, nimsa shakol ha'ose imi tova ora. So therefore we find, whoever does anything good or bad to me, bein begufi, whether bodily, bein bemoni, my money, bein bechodi, my honor, shali chusad rachmana ka'avi. This person is doing the shlichus of Hashem. He is a messenger from Hashem. And yes, Megagalim Chobal Yedei Chayav, that, uh, that's that person's problem. You know, he's got to introspect and think, why did it have to come from him? But the fact that I received it, I recognize this is from Hashem. And sometimes, let's say it's someone that we really wouldn't expect something like that from them. Like we really trusted them. So that, then we have to say that that's part of our test from Hashem. And Mifun Tzara Adra means according to the effort is the reward. And we're going to, soon we'll get further to understand this idea better about the test from Hashem. So he says, when this yeso, when this foundation, the fact that whatever happens to me, that is from Hashem, and this person is just a messenger, says this has to be set within our brains, the masmerim valimot, like nails that won't budge. We have to knock this empty into our head. I remember when we were having um, a, a new floor put in in our kitchen many years ago, and my husband was putting in the subfloor. So he's told when he does that, he has to knock those nails in way below the surface because when you walk on it, it kind of jiggles it and they can make their way up and pop up. Nowadays, they use staples. But uh, <coughs> then it was bang, 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 bang. And when I heard this, like, it reminded me of that how you have to keep banging that idea into your head over and over again. Some people say they, they walk around like this, <laughs> bringing Hashem into the picture. That's what we want to do. So when we have this yesod, this foundation, really set in their good, taskil v'tavim she'en l'hashim is chaver. Then you'll understand that you don't have to blame the next person. Okay? I don't have to blame them. I'm saying it's from Hashem. So I should get angry at Hashem instead? You know? No. Because we know, that, okay, everything that happens from Hashem, but everything that Hashem does is only for our best. For 
whatever reason, I needed that. Why did I need that? Okay, that, that's part of some of our tools. We will see that in a moment. Yeah. I mean, isn't there a point where your attitude toward the person who did this piece of harm to you should be taken? I mean, for example, the man who parked in front of my driveway, hey, that's almost illegal. You not, has no right to do so it. So I should call the police on him and make sure he's taken away and arrested? Can you repeat that question? No. She I'm said, not. you know, what, what should be done? So let's say like this. I should make it clear that whatever we're talking about, you know, when we're talking about the tools and forgiveness and a person who is experiencing abuse at the hands of, this, of another person, that I'm, I'm not touching on, on, on that. That the person is going to, you know, have to talk to somebody much greater than me to, to find out how they should feel, what they should do. We're talking about the, the smaller stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff, and sometimes it will be bigger stuff, but not abusive type of situations. Well, the man who, who parked in front of the driveway was not being abusive, he was just being negligent. Okay, but, so but should we not say to the man, you know, this is not a place. Oh, you could, you could let him know, you know, but you're, but if once you use the tools, you're not going to be screaming and yelling at him like a madman. You'll be able to tell him calmly. And when you're angry and trying to tell the person what they did wrong, when you're angry, they are not going to hear. They're only going to hear the anger. So this is really the first step. So, it, I mean, certainly a person, it, when we say this, a person doesn't need to be taken advantage of. They have to know when action has to be taken. But in, in uh, situations where no action has to be taken, then, you know, it's either I'm going to remain angry or I'm going to let it go. And when I know it's from Hashem, I'm going to let it go. Let me give you one more example. Maybe one more. Um, so this was a scenario I kind of made up after 9-11. But you know what? I bet you there were a lot of scenarios like this. So this scenario was... You know, a person who had who works at the World Trade Center. It's 9-11, they have to get to work on time. They have a very, very important meeting, and they go out to their car to get to work, and somebody, once again, is blocking their driveway. And they are very upset, and they see it's their neighbor. Now it's early in the morning, because they have to get to work on time. They go knocking on their neighbor's door, says, would you please move your car? I need to get out. And the neighbor says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not dressed yet. Uh, I'll, I'll be out in about 45 minutes. I need you to move that car now. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't, goodbye. So the anger you feel because of this person, you are going to miss that meeting. You may be fired from your job and then let's say a half hour, 45 minutes later, you find out that that actually saved your life. So now how do you feel towards this person? So when I presented this to my students in the 11th grade, they said, I'm sorry, it was still a chutzpah. It was still wrong. Yeah, it was still wrong. It's true, but are you angry at them? Are you angry? You know, here you could see so clearly that they were a messenger from Hashem to save your life. And maybe you'll be a little bit grateful to them even though they didn't do it to save your life. You know, they did it because that's the way they are and Hashem put it in their head to do that. So the truth is, most of the time, we are not going to see how what other people do that inconveniences, inconveniences us or hurts us really helps us. But, you know, there, there are stories that are told, and really I'm jumping ahead because we're really getting into another tool. So, um, another thing on this tool that uh, we have in this safer tells us Hi, excuse me, yes. what does MVD stand for? 
All right, if you want to jump ahead while well, I'm looking for my place, it stands for I thought we were still in there. <laughs> Number two. Oh, 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 no, I thought you said MVP, nine. No. Okay. NVD. Right. NVD is, I told you that um, in the book Battle Plans, they talk about turning on the light. In other words, thank you, you're getting me back on track. In other words, when I see what happened and I see this rude person who blocked the driveway, I'm not seeing Hashem. So, it's a dark world. We, it's hard to see Hashem. Hashem is hidden right now. So we have to put on our NVD night vision devices. And in the book, it goes into how it works, how it causes us to see in the dark. And then they, they translate NVD as notice very deeply, how we should notice Hashem in every situation. So from night vision devices seeing in the dark, it becomes noticed very deeply, Hashem in every situation. Thank you. And then also the Malchus button. So this is also taken from battle plans. We say every time we are able to say, this is from you, Hashem. <coughs> then we are crowning Hashem as king. We are acknowledging that he is the king, and he is the one that makes everything happen. And they, they describe it as pressing the Malchus button. Yeah. So with the last example of the woman who said, yeah, I don't care. I'll get out when I want to get out. And yeah, just because she because that action helps save your life, so you thank Hashem. But that person's still, I hate to say it, a jerk, and from that point on, I might go over there and say thank you, but my negative opinion of that person is still going to be there. If they had said, look, I need some help in order to get out to go and get the car, then I would have been like, yeah, sure, let me help you. Or they said, look, I'm just trying to deal with 100,000 things, and I need, you know, give me as much time as I right. can. That's one thing. But if this person has the chutzpah to act like that, then from that time on, I'm just going to say, you know what, just expect this behavior from them and try to avoid it okay. as much as possible. So our, our, our focus should still be... I mean, you can't forgive Paro just because he acted the way he acted. He, because okay, of but Paro this is not Paro. Right. I mean, we're we're not talking about Paro here. We're talking about a Jewish neighbor who was acted, acted rudely. Yes, okay. you have responsibilities, so you should still, I, you don't have to hate them, you just so the idea, that behavior. Right, so the idea here is that sometimes Hashem, if we say that people are messengers from Hashem, I have to say sometimes Hashem puts it in the head of a person to say something, to act in a certain way for our benefit. And here it would seem like the opposite. But here it really was for our benefit. So you could ask, so where's Bechira? So again, we go back to the idea of Megal Galin Zechusa Yidei Zakai Bechobal Yidei Chayav. That Hashem does make things happen through people who are, who merit to have good things happen through them or, or otherwise. So if I focus on the, the idea that Hashem sent this person to to act that way so that my life would be saved. So then I'm, I won't necessarily be, be angry at this person. Be angry, but expect that behavior. And but that I have a bigger problem. So it, it could be sometimes out of character. I mean, if, if I know that that's thing. always the way the person is, right. then I go to my first tool, down the Costas, try to understand the person better. Right. But, but for the one person who was rude, the hundred other people perhaps who who gently and kindly immediately move their car, does that mean God wanted those hundred people to die? No, I mean, that is, I have a problem with, I, I was late, therefore I was saved. But for all those good people who weren't late. Okay, I think it's Rabbi Tauber who, who says, you know, one time he missed a plane, so he <laughs> thought to himself, okay, maybe that plane is going to crash. And then he said, what am I saying? Uh, 150 people have to die so that you know, so that I can see that this is from Hashem. No, even if absolutely nothing happens, then. But yes, we do say for those other people, 
Each person who was there, their time had come. And for each person, it wasn't because somebody was polite to them and moved their car. It was Hashem arranged whoever was supposed to be there would be there. That is what we believe in Hashkacha Pratis, which is personal supervision over everyone. And, uh, you know, the, there's a, a lot of different stories of people who were saved, and then there's the people that were there. There's a story of um, the family who wanted, they wanted to go on vacation, that was the summer before, to Israel. And there was a lot of bombings during that time, during that time, when isn't there, and his parents didn't want them to go. So instead, they vacationed at the Grand Canyon, and they took a helicopter tour, and for the first time in the history of those helicopter tours, there was some malfunction, and the helicopter crashed at the bottom of the canyon, and he was killed. I don't remember if his wife was okay or not. I don't remember. But, um, so at any rate, for his shloshim, 30, this man had worked in the World Trade Center. His shloshim, when they were having the Hakamas Hamasika, when they were having the unveiling in, in New York, was 9-11. And all of his co-workers who worked with him, instead of going to work that morning, they went to the cemetery for the unveiling. We see from this story how Hashem orchestrates everything. You know, nothing is a mistake. Whatever's meant to happen is going to happen. You had, you had said that we were talking about ordinary interactions between people. Yet 9-11 is certainly an extraordinary case of, you know. So that, that was a scenario I just made up to give an example. Yeah, but I mean, you see the difference. This attack on, on innocent people. Yeah, but that wasn't what I was focusing on. That wasn't the focus. The focus was on the person who's angry because someone's blocking their driveway. <laughs> so we're not always going to see why something's for our good. Okay. Maybe I will just share this with you if I found it, and then we will go for a short break. Okay, so over here, he shares from uh, for us that a car has brakes. We're all aware of, hopefully. And uh, in Hebrew, the brakes are called bricks. Blumim. <laughs> brakes. Bricks. So there is a chazal that says, Talaha aretz al blima. Now, literally, that means that the world is suspended in nothingness, that Hashem has suspended the earth in nothingness, in, in air. So another way to translate this is the world is suspended on or depends on blima, not the brakes of the car, but on stopping, on stopping what? On stopping our mouths. When, at a time of an argument, it says when a person is quiet, they remain quiet, they don't lash out back at a person. When they are being hurt and they remain quiet, the world exists in their merit. It says a person who will argue with someone who who will get angry at someone who may have done something to him. So if someone would come and ask them, why are you getting angry? Says, the reason why you are getting angry is because you lack a moon in Hashem. Now they're going to get angry at you as well. Like, how can you say such a thing? This person hurt me and I'm upset with them. And because of that, you say, I lack a moon in Hashem. Says, yes. Because a person is, who gets, gets angry at somebody else, so he is in effect saying that this 
that, that this person has power over him, that Hashem has nothing to do with this. And so you're negating the fact that Hashem runs the world, that Eno Milvado, there's no other power except for Hashem. So <coughs> those who remain quiet, in other words, not just that they remain quiet, but they recognize, okay, this is from Hashem, this is exactly what I needed. We are allowed to defend ourselves if somebody is, you know, uh, accusing us or insulting us. We're allowed to say, you know, that's not really very nice. But to insult back and to lash out back at them, that we shouldn't do. And it says that those who just remain silent because they recognize it's from Hashem, that those people are very loved by Hashem and that the world is, it exists in their merit. And also it brings upon them a much Yeshuos. So once we're able to bring Hashem into the picture, we strengthen ourselves in the Muna that Hashem is the one that is in charge of everything that happens in my life, even those things that are come through other people. What we say sometimes is, you know, it's hard to see Hashem because this person who hurt me, they're like standing in the way, like I can't see Hashem behind them. But we have to notice very deeply and recognize that even those things that are done through people, it's really from Hashem. Okay, so now the question is, why? Did Hashem send it? Why do I need this? So we say it really was a tremendous opportunity that Hashem was sending me. And uh, we'll explain in how many different ways. Okay, first, for number three over here, we say it was a kapara. So we say in Yiddish, a kapara. So there's two ways you could say it. Hey, so it's sign a kapara. It should be a kapara. <coughs> kapara is an atonement. Or we could say, ah, so it's sign a kapara. I should feel happy. If I understood what a kapara was, then I would really feel happy about it. What is a kapara? Hash Hashem does not punish us for our sins in this world. He instead, all our, our, a person's punishment is waiting in the next world. What we get in this world are kaparos, our atonements, so that it will take away from our punishment in the next world. So therefore, we see it's really a good thing. It's taking the place of eternal punishment that I'm just getting it in, getting it over here. Now, if it's something like an insult or an embarrassment, I should be very grateful that I could swap those punishments in the next world for such a thing. So it's brought down here um, from Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, who is the author of Tomer Deborah, who would say, all of the teshuvos in the world, all the different types of teshuva that a person can do, the best type to erase a person's sins is to be able to, is svilas el bonos, to be able to tolerate insults. <laughs> um, insults and shame that comes his way. And this is the really best type because in other types, for instance, there were people who would fast a long time or they would do other things to to cause themselves to suffer so that it would be for them as, you know, as a kapara, atonement for their sins. She said, with all of that, a person really weakens his body and he's not able to serve Hashem in the optimal way. So the best way to, to receive a, a, an atonement to do teshuva is to be so vel albonos is to tolerate those insults. So he gives an example, and this is really very frightening how, how he puts it. He says, think to yourself, if you were asked, would you like to go bankrupt, lose all your money, or perhaps 
have your roof cave in, have your house collapse? You'd answer, no. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. No, I would not. And if you would be asked, well, then, how about would you like to take upon yourself the death of children? You'd answer, chas v'shalom. Hashem should just guard over them. Im yamrulacha, if you would be asked, well, would you like to be sick with any of these awful, painful, or terminal illnesses? Right away, your heart would race, and you'd say, Rachmana litzlan, no, Hashem should save me from such things. <coughs> Well, then how about Misa, death, Gehenna, Gilgalim, Ra'im? Gilgalim are... Reincarnation. What's the word in English? Reincarnation. Reincarnation. Uh, difficult reincarnations. And there too, certainly you would answer no. So then they would ask, well, how do you expect your sins to be atoned for in this world? So the best answer is... To be sovel elbonos, when an insult comes my way, when somebody hurts me, to recognize this is a kapara. Now it's true, we cannot choose the way Hashem sends us kaparos. If Hashem chooses to, it will come in a very difficult way. The idea here is, if we see Hashem is sending it through an insult, or somebody embarrasses us, how grateful we should really feel for that, that, that Hashem chose to send it that way instead of something much more difficult. And he continues and he says, in the Svarim of the Ari, that um, tolerating insults helps, is, is a benefit to the nefesh. As we said, more than, you know, fasts and, and uh, any kind of self-torture, said, from now on, if people would know how beneficial it was to receive an insult, they would run out into the marketplace and they'd grab somebody by the shirt tails and they would say, please embarrass me, insult me. Not that we should do that because the person would be sinning if they would do that. But he's just saying, if we knew how beneficial it was to our neshamas, to our souls, that's, that's how we would feel. We, we would be so happy. Now, of course, if somebody is going to insult you, you know, if you're like me, you, you will not automatically feel Hashem and be so excited. <laughs> but you know what? You will, after calming down a little bit, after a little time passes, thinking about it, you will feel very grateful, perhaps, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because you recognize it was an atonement and it was really for your good. And he says something so beautiful. Afterwards, he said, And he says, and so it is with any type of uh, embarrassments, big or large, even those you cause yourself. If you could think of a time where you just put your foot in your mouth and you said something embarrassing or you did something stupid, and every time you remember it, you just turn red from embarrassment, you can now think to yourself, that was so good for me. That was so beneficial for my neshama. And how much better that makes you feel. He says, you have to know, yeshlo toba gedolomazai, you have tremendous benefit from that. Now, we're not talking about when you do it on purpose. You know, we're not asking anybody to purposely make a fool of themselves. <laughs> but we can often do it without even meaning to. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, moving on. The next one we come to is mida keneged mida. Yes. Could we take questions at sure. the end? Because we want to make sure we have time to get through okay. this. Is yeah, it okay? My question is just a quick comment. I just want to say in regards to like sick people that a lot of times we, I mean, we down here, we don't understand Hashem's master plan. And because someone is sick, I'm saying we can't look at them or us or I mean whoever no, for is sure not. and for say, sure not. oh, this is a kapara, well, because of, you know. Right. So I, I try to stress the point that 
we are just looking at this from the point of if I am give a scent an insult, first recognizing it's from Hashem and then feeling that I should be grateful that this is how Hashem chose to send the kapara. We can't choose how Hashem sends it and Hashem has his reason for each and every person and there's no way for us to understand his ways. Definitely. Okay? All right, so with mida connected mida, which means measure for measure, if we are going to be forgiving, so then Hashem is going to be forgiving of us. The Chazal that's written here is kol hamavir al midosov maviri moa kol peshav. So to be maavir al midosov. Literally, what does that mean? A person has certain midos. When somebody angers me, my natural inclination is to be angry, to be upset, to be hurt. So to be ma'avir, to cross over that mida. I take that normal inclination to be angry, to be hurt, and I drop it and I walk away. That is what the expression to be ma'avir al midosav means. To be, to be forgiving. To just not be upset. So it says, kol ha-ma'avir al midosav. And, and that is the mida of Vatranis that we're talking about, of being forgiven, forgiving. Kol ha-ma'avir al midosav. What is he zokatu? What does he merit? Ma'avir in lo al kol pashav. So then... Hashem will just drop his averos, his sins, and walk away from it, so to speak. In other words, you forgive your friend, then you will merit that Hashem will forgive you for all of your sins. And the Chavitz Chaim says on this, if we were told that by working on this mita of Atranus, that you would get less punishment for one avera, said it would be worth it to work on this this mita of being forgiving. But that's not what it's saying. And if we would say we're being forgiven for one sin completely, it would certainly be worth it. Here it says, They will be forgiven for all of their sins. The Peshayim are the worst type of sins, the ones done out of rebellion. So the Chavetz Chaim is telling us how but look how great is the benefit that in the merit of being forgiving of others, we will merit that Hashem will forgive us for our sins. The Chavetz Chaim explains us that we won't have to go through the regular um, steps of teshuva as long as we don't repeat the sin. If we are forgiving, Hashem will forgive us. Now, it really goes a step further because not only are we bringing down forgiveness for ourselves when we are forgiving of other people, but at the same time, we are bringing down that midah from HaKadosh Baruch Hu for all of Klal Yisrael. When I work on being forgiving of other people, I make it that Hashem will be forgiving of Klal Yisrael. That's that's what we said at the beginning, how we we are actually, it really is in our hands to bring Mashiach that much sooner because Hashem wants to forgive us, but he needs somebody to show forgiveness so that we can bring down that forgiveness and that Rahmanus, that 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 compassion and mercy. So it's like we could think to ourselves, Hashem is sending us on a mission. Not a mission impossible, but it's a mission to forgive this person. Hashem created this scenario where this person hurt me, and he's waiting to see what I'm going to do with it. He wants me to be forgiving so that I can, well, I'll certainly gain from that, but all of Kol Yisrael will gain. We really see from here how Kol Yisrael are raving, how we're responsible for one another. How 
you know, when we think of you know all the terrible things going on among among Jews, the the, the tragedies happening, and you feel like, well, what can I do? Well, there's something that we can do by working on this meetup that we really, you know, increasing shalom. That 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 this is really really will have a immense impact in Shemayim. Okay, move on to the next one. Probably wondering, remember Napoleon? Now why should I remember Napoleon? So a story goes with this. And it's really actually, remember the lesson that we learned from this story about Napoleon. Okay, this story is brought down in this safer. It says that when Napoleon was out conquering city after city, he came, it was already, winter was approaching. They had a city in Russia surrounded. They had laid siege on it, and they were waiting for the city to surrender. And it was taking longer than they expected. So the, the soldiers were getting a little antsy. They knew, they had heard about what Russian winters were like. They hadn't seen their family in a long time, and they wanted to just... They, they approached Napoleon and said, could we just pack up and go home? You know, this, this just isn't working here. So he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, I, I'll um, disguise myself as a Russian pauper and together with another officer, we'll sneak in the city and we'll go see what morale is like. And if morale is high, and we see everybody's doing fine and they probably have plenty of food and it's gonna take very long, we'll pack up and leave. But if we see if morale is low and people are really hungry and there's not so much food in the city, then we know we just have to sit tight and it won't be too much longer before we can conquer the city. So that's what he did. He and a fellow and an officer, you know, disguised themselves, they snuck into the city, walking around a little bit, and they come to uh, an inn where they find a lot of soldiers sitting there, drinking away their misery and their hunger, and they're, they're talking to each other about how terrible the situation is, and they pretty much get their answer. But before they have a chance to leave, all of a sudden, one of the Russian soldiers sees him, and he says to his fellow soldiers, that man over there, that's Napoleon. They look at him like, you must be drunk. What would Napoleon be doing here in the city when he's outside of the city laying siege? No, I'm telling you, before the war I was in France and I saw him at a parade, that's Napoleon. So Napoleon's officer thought quickly and he had a plan and he goes to Napoleon, go get me a drink. So Napoleon plays along and he goes and he gets a drink and he brings it back and he accidentally on purpose spills it all over his his officer and the officer gives him a slap and he kicks him down on the ground and he starts cursing him as he's kicking him and everybody's watching this seeing what's happening and when they see how this this one so-called pauper is, is uh, treating the other one they start laughing at the one who said that was Napoleon. You still think that's Napoleon? Nobody would do that to the great general Napoleon. So they saw they were safe as soon as they could. They got out of there. And as soon as they got to safety, the officer gets down on his knees and begs forgiveness from Napoleon. So sorry, he said, what are you talking about? Get up here. I owe you my life. If there's anything I could give you, please tell me. So what's the most of the story? You know, the, the, the one writing the story, he says, imagine if instead of reacting the way Napoleon did when he was kicked and cursed like that, he said, how dare you do that to me? That would have been the end of him. They would recognize right away that's Napoleon and he would have been killed. He knew that those kicks those slaps, the curses were coming to save his life. So that's the Musra Haskell. That is what we need to learn. Sometimes Hashem sends a person to, to hurt us in some way, whether it's insult us, shame us, 
And really, it's coming to tear up in, in place of, of a bad gazera. And if we recognize that, that bad gazera, that bad decree, is torn up. It says here, this meter of forgiveness of Vachranus helps sometimes to add life to that person. Even if it was already decreed that that person should die, and he can lengthen his days in this world. Sometimes when a person humbles himself or he is humbled by somebody else and he remains silent, in other words, he doesn't fight back with that person, but accepts it. So at that moment, bad decrees, bad difficult decrees are torn up. If that's the case, how foolish it is of the person who makes a machlokas, who makes an argument, a fight with the person who shamed him, Rather, he should honor him. That person really just gave him life. The ein who may gain, and he doesn't understand because they are shaluchei Hashem. That person is a messenger from Hashem to redeem him from death and to save him and to actually, you know, benefit him. So that is the lesson that we want to remember from Napoleon. This is, to me, this is one tool that really, really helps me in a lot of ways. I'll give you an example of something that happened to me. That um, when we first moved here, so we found out that somebody was selling an air conditioning unit. And um, so we asked him, can we, can we try it out? See if we if we like it, then we'll buy it. And they said no problem. So we brought it to the house. We put it in the window. We didn't feel it cooled off the room good enough, so we took it out, put it in my front hall, and neglected to call the person back. A few days pass. Maybe it was a week, and the person calls up, and he says, "So, did you make a decision?" And I said, "Oh yeah, it didn't work for us, so we're not going to take it." This person started screaming and yelling at me. He said, now I know what type of people you are, and I'm never going to deal with you again, and, and I could have sold it to somebody else. Now, I admit I was, I was in the wrong. But even if you've done something wrong, you don't want somebody yelling at you and insulting you. You know, they could tell you, well, it really wasn't right. You should have let me know right away. And I would have said, oh, you're right, and I apologize. So. You know, here I'm holding the phone, the person is screaming and yelling at me, and tears are running down my face. I'm very, very hurt. And because Baruch Hashem, I, I had my tools, as the tears were flowing down my face, I was thinking to myself, thank you, Hashem. Who knows what this person is saving me from right now? Who knows what bad decree is being torn up? And when you could think that, it's such a good feeling. To be, I mean, it's never a good feeling to be yelled at, but to know that there is really benefit in this. This is from Hashem, and I am really benefiting from it. So there was a story that was told of this Rav in Yushalayim, maybe some 100 years ago, who had a very bit bad infection on his leg. And it just got worse when he went to the doctor the doctor said, We're, we have no choice. We're going to have to amputate or else it's going to spread to the rest of your body. To save your life, we have to amputate. So they scheduled another appointment for about a week later where he was supposed to come to the doctor. The doctor would decide if he's well enough to be for, for the surgery. In the meantime, he was walking down the street with the help of, of one of his students. And all of a sudden, this lady comes out of her grocery store and approaches him and starts yelling and screaming at him. So you're the one that caused all the damage in my store with all the water coming in. And she's yelling and screaming, carrying on, and people are stopping to hear what's happening. And 
and it was very embarrassing for him. And it was a case of mistaken identity because he had nothing to do with ever with whatever damage happened in her store. But he didn't say a word. And this lady finally finished her tirade and she went back in her store and he continued on the way. The next day when he went to the doctor, the doctor was amazed. He said, I, 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 I would never believe this, but, but the infection is starting to go away. And the man felt that there was a direct connection between that lady coming out of her store and yelling and screaming at him and embarrassing him and that Gezerah, that bad decree being torn up. And he went straight to thank her. Now, I don't think that's always a good idea for us to thank the person, <laughs> but at least, at least we could thank HaKadosh Baruch and we could turn to him and we could say thank you. Who knows what that was saving me from? Okay, um, let's move on to number six. To think to ourselves, okay, this is a test. This is from Hashem. Hashem is testing me right now. To put the picture in my mind, Hashem, something just happened, I'm embarrassed, I'm hurt, whatever it is, and I have this picture in my mind of Hashem up there with his great book. Okay, let's see how you're going to do. When I think to myself, Hashem's testing me right now, I'm going to react differently. Like I heard that in um, a, a seminar given to teachers, that um, what they did was, uh, you know, they put one of the teachers who was in the seminar up at the front of the class of other teachers and what the other teacher is supposed to do is they start uh, they, uh, spit spitballs and, and throw airplanes and like, misbehave in different ways just to test the teacher to see how he's going to react. Now when you know you're being tested, you're going you're to you're gonna ace that test. <laughs> When you don't know, you might get angry. So if we recognize, okay, Hashem is testing me. He created this scenario to see how I'm going to do. If I pass that test, hmm, I get Hashem's brachos. Okay, that's where we come to the idea of the lottery ticket. I can imagine this scenario where somebody just did something that really upset me. This scenario is a lottery ticket that Hashem just handed me. It's a winning lottery ticket. But to be able to cash it in, I have to react the right way. If I react with anger and don't see Hashem in the picture and just see this person that did it and just feel the hurt and react in anger, it's like I took that lottery ticket and I tore it up and threw it away. But if I see Hash bring Hashem into the picture, and I recognize this is from him, and this is for my good, and I don't get angry, I could take that lottery ticket and now cash it in for the jackpot, which is Hashem's brothers. So sometimes, we're told that sometimes Hashem sends these situations because he wants to shower upon us his brothers, but first, he wants to test us to see to what extent we're zokhet to that bracha? So it's like, there's a lottery ticket. Let me see how you do, if you could cash it in or not. So Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein, who is a rub in B'nai Brak, he tells over the story in one of his safarim of uh, one Erev Sukkis. Somebody, uh, a neighbor comes to him and he says, please, Rabbi, you must come up to my apartment and see what my neighbor did. And he was ready to explode. He was so upset. <coughs> and so the Rav went up and he saw why he was so upset. This was Arab Sukkis. He brought him out to the sukkah where the you know all the decorations had been put up so beautifully and the table was already set. And the neighbor upstairs had washed his floor, done sponge up, oh and it must have been an old building, or his was an extension, and the pipe that all the dirty water goes down when they push it there, right on top of his sukkah. 
and filthy water was dripping from the schach all over the beautiful, what had been beautiful direct, uh, decorations and what had been a beautiful set table. We can understand why the person was upset. So the Rav decided rather than go up right away and yell at the person upstairs, of course he wouldn't yell at them, but make them aware, he decided he was going to talk to this person and tell him about what he had read. There's a mitzvah in the Torah that we call Azov Ta'azov. And that mitzvah is if you see your enemy's donkey, I hope I'm saying it right, crouching under its burden. You have a mitzvah. Here, Azov Ta'azov means you shall surely help. You should surely go and help him. So the question is, those words, azov tazov, it usually means, would mean you should surely leave. Azov means to leave. This is the only place in the Torah where it's used, that, that shoresh, that word is used to mean to help. So why is that used here? It's telling you, you drop all of your complaints against this enemy and go help him. Azov tazov. And Hashem will drop his complaints against you. So he's telling him, if we drop our complaints against, against someone who has caused us harm, so this really connects also to our tool of Mida connected Mida, Hashem will drop complaints against you. And then he continued and he said, he said about how sometimes Hashem sends us these misyonos, these tests, to see how we're going to react. And because he wants to send us brachos. And if we don't act with anger and keep a level head, then we are so head to those brachos. And he says, what's more, he continued quoting from the safer that he had, what's more, but a person who can do that is, has a clean slate like a newborn baby. Like all of his abeiros are erased. He said, how foolish would be the person to, to just get angry and not recognize this. So now please understand, this doesn't mean you can't go up to the neighbor and make them aware. No, I told you, look down first but, and see if something's there. Don't do this. If we use the tool of dumb the chus, we could think, Maybe a child did it. Or maybe there was a bucket on the, on, on the balcony that turned over and it went down. Usually they're very careful not to do it. There could be different reasons, but at any rate, you know, once you've used the tools, then you could go up and talk to them in a calm way to so make sure that it doesn't happen anymore. But that's not forgetting the fact that I'm bringing Hashem into the picture and this this was to serve the pur a certain purpose, and it was really so beneficial for me. That's why we keep saying, these hurts are opportunities, Hashem is sending me, opportunities, as we said, for a kapara, opportunities to, to merit forgiveness for my sins, an opportunity to merit Hashem's brachos. Okay, moving on to Shalom Fund. So sometimes, a, a lot of times, a disagreement we have with a person will have to do with money. We feel that uh, they, we made Sheva Brachos and they didn't, pay, they didn't pay their fair share. Or uh, they cheated me out of money. Or they, they keep borrowing things and they never pay back. So the Chavitz Chaim says that a person should put aside a certain amount of money every year, and that money goes into his shalom fund. That's put aside for the mitzvah of shalom. Just like a person makes sure that he has money for matzos for Pesach, or he moves into a new home, he makes sure he has the money for mezuzos. I mean, in our day and age, we don't have to physically take that money and put it aside in a box so that we have it. In the time of the Chavetz time, they probably did. But this could be mentally, putting aside money for that. 
a person, once Pesach comes, a person doesn't say, mm, we really didn't do too well this year. We're going to have to forget about matzos. You know, it's just too expensive. Or, uh, you know, we'll wait to buy mezuzos when, when the business does a little bit better. These are mitzvos that we make sure that we have the money for. So it is with the mitzvah of shalom, to, to have the money to pay out for shalom. That means if somebody, uh, so Robert Sam gave this, this example. She said she had a painter in the house, and the painter broke the, the um, light fixture. So she asked him to, she called him up, she said, uh, you know, she, she needs to be paid back for it. He said, yeah, yeah, I'll bring over the money. So a week or two passes, and she calls again. He says, oh, yeah, I forgot, yeah. Don't worry, I'll bring it over. And then more time, he, he didn't have it. So she calls up again, and he says, um, you know what, just get a new fixture and send me the bill, and I'll send you the money. So still doesn't work. So then when she calls up again, he says, you know what, next time you get your house painted, I'll take it off the bill. Now, she might not get the house painted for a while, and even if she does, so she's going to ask him to. She says, what are, what are the choices now? I can stand in front of his house and pick at him. I can speak Lushan Hara about him. I could call his wife every day and, and say, get me that money. Or, when we're talking about being mavater on money, we're not saying that you don't need to make any effort to get it. Somebody said she did a lot of babysitting for someone and they didn't pay her. She's embarrassed to ask. Well, people are forgetful. You might be embarrassed, but they do owe you that money. They're not saying they don't owe you that money, and they would probably appreciate that you let them know. You know, it's, it's uncomfortable having to chase after people, but that's what we have to do. But if a person says, no, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't owe you anything, you know, they borrow a gown and they bring it back uh, dirty and they say, you know, you need to pay for cleaning. I said, oh, that spot was there already when, when we borrowed it. So maybe it was, but if you know it wasn't and they won't do anything, so your choice is either to hold a grudge, which is really not a, 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 such a good choice, or, okay, I'm going to take this out of my shalom fund. So the Chavitz Chaim said, some people might feel like, well, if I'm always going to be taking out of my shalom fund, who knows how many thousands of dollars I'm going to be spending on this mitzvah they don't have. He says, we're really talking about the small things. You know, we're not talking about big things. No person's able to take somebody to, to deem Torah over a large amount of money, and some things just aren't worth it. Um, there was, oh, so, so the Chavitz Chaim says that we should know that this is the best benefit. When a person is mavater money for the sake of shalom, instead of making a fight with you over this money, I am going to be mavater. I'm going to just let go of that. So Hashem promises that he will pay you back double. Now, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> And you won't always see it. And I've heard stories where people saw that they got paid back exactly that amount. But the Chavitz Chaim says, even, even double. So there's one story of uh, um, an optician. He had a, a store in a neighborhood in Yushalayim for many, many years. And then one day somebody else opens an optical store right near his. And he goes to a rub and he asks, like, Am I allowed to bring them to base team for trespassing over my my boundaries because you know I had the store here first. Is he really allowed to do that? So the Rav said, the truth is you would be allowed to bring him. You are in the right. You could bring him to base team. But if you would take my advice, it's not worth the aggravation. If I were you, I would close up and just open up. This is somebody who had a store over there for a long time. But he took the rub's advice. He became so much more successful, he ended up opening up a second store. So he was really able to see how Hashem paid him back double. 
So there are a lot of small things that people get upset over. Someone said how a neighbor had borrowed something. It was something that cost less than a dollar. Said, I've reminded them that they didn't pay me back. They haven't paid me back yet. And they say, oh yeah, yeah, right. And she was just so upset over it. And she, she just couldn't let go of the anger over this little item. And she said, I know it's, it's not the money, it's the principle of the matter. But, you know, it's like someone said, if I have to pay $100 for a lawyer to get back that $40 from that person, I'm going to do that. So if, you, if the principle of the matter is really important, you know, the, the, our priority is shalom. And that's, that's what should be the most important thing to us. And um, I see it's getting late, so I had another story. But the point is over here that Hashem, if, so, if we feel someone has caused us a large loss, from Rosh Hashanah, Hashem decides exactly how much money we are supposed to have from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah, and nobody can take that away from us. So we have to say, if I don't have it, if I lost it, if that person caused me this loss, no, it was from Hashem. I wasn't supposed to have it. And if I was supposed to have it, Hashem will get it back to me in a different way. And that's what we have to keep in mind. Okay, we'll go quickly over the, the rest. Not Reuven, the Palestine brings a mushal. The mushal is of a man who needs, a, a, he's going to a certain city and someone says, oh, you're going there. Could you please bring a package to my brother Reuven? So sure, he goes to the city and he asks around, excuse me, do you know where Reuven lives? I have a package for him. And, he's, and someone says, you know what, there's a lot of people over in the marketplace, maybe you'll find them there. So you go there, so you go to the first person, excuse me, are you Reuven? No, I'm Shimon. Um, are you Reuven? No, I'm Levi. Now, would it ever occur to this person to get angry at Shimon or Levi that they weren't Reuven? <coughs> no, he'd keep looking until he found the right person. She says, so it is, when a person doesn't come through for us, when we are upset because they won't do us that favor, we have to tell ourselves, they are not Reuven. They are not the ones that it was decreed in heaven that the, the, um, the, the, the favor should come from. So that's the not Reuven. Even who the favor is supposed to come from is already decided in heaven. And if I'm upset because I really felt this person should have done it, so I can recognize that now is my chance to bring Hashem into the picture, and I get credit for every single moment of that emunah bitachon, I display that this is from Hashem. Hey, MDP is Midos Development Program. Whoever Hashem put in my life, they are meant to be in my life. They are my meet, part of my Midos Development Program. Hashem is our personal trainer. He knows exactly what Midos we need to exercise. So he sends us someone who's going to help us exercise Patience, tolerance, forgiveness, whatever it is that we need. Okay, and then we come to our last one, and that is to be a power plant. Rabbi Ezreal, Ezreal Tauber says it is safer as in heaven, so on earth. He says that there is something called a private Kiddush Hashem. The thing of a Kiddush Hashem is something that's made in front of other people, and people think, Wow, how beautiful. Look, look at their actions. A private Kiddush Hashem is when it's only between me and Hashem. I wanted to say something. Maybe I wanted to say a Lashon Hara, and I held myself back. Only Hashem knows. That's a private Kiddush Hashem. This person said something insulting, and I felt like saying something back, and I kept quiet. Once again, that's a private Kiddush Hashem. I feel hurt. And I work on myself. I work, use these tools to work out the hurt so I'm not no longer angry. Once again, I've made a private Kiddush Hashem. He said a private Kiddush Hashem has the power to help other Yidden throughout the world. 
We don't know in what way or who we are helping, but we are helping other people within Kla Yisrael through that private Kedushim. Once again, we see Kla Yisrael Arabim Zelazeh. We also said that uh, we have to remember when we, when we work on forgiveness, we're bringing that from HaKadosh Baruch for ourselves and for all of Kla Yisrael. One last thing, which isn't on here, and that is tefillah. Some situations are super, super difficult to let go. And we say, even with all this, it's too hard. I've tried, I've worked on it, it's too hard. It's impossible. So I would say, you might be right. It might be possible to do on your own. But with Hashem's help, anything is possible. So tefillah, tefillah, tefillah. Ask Hashem to help you let go, to forgive, to be done with Katsafus. Just like we need Hashem's help for anything else, we also need Hashem's help for doing mitzvahs. And certainly this mitzvah, hopefully, with the help of these tools, we'll all be able to be washing up very soon. Thank you, thank you. We have flyers. This cut off the press. My husband brought them. Everyone's invited from 3 to 6 p.m. This Shabbos, it's a free seminar. It's Rabbi Yomta Blazer. So you can take this. And we see around some more of these, the handouts. We have handouts and then this for everybody. And now, at the end of your class, we always stop for a minute. It's an ace ratzon. It's a time we can dive. Right. Gates of Shuri Mind. Please explain what that okay. is. Okay, at the end of Yamima, Rebetzin Yamima Mizrahi's Shi Urim, she would have this ace ratzon. She said, Rav Avadi Yosef Zatzal said that when women get together, and they get together to learn, to, to work on themselves, to improve, that becomes an Isra zone, a time where our, our prayers are so much more potent. So we will take the next few moments to just for everybody to privately sing their, say their own prayers. I think the fact that it's Rosh Chodesh also gives it a, an extra potency. May all of our tequilos be answered for good. Amen.